Welcome into the Ballpark Digest broadcaster chat. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler, joined once again by Kevin Reichard from Ballpark Digest. Before we introduce our guest for this week, Kevin, how are you? I am good. I am uh, ready to go see some more baseball soon. And you guys are, are will be seeing baseball soon as well. Yes, we will. Let me introduce the voice of the Dayton Dragons, Tom Nichols. Tom, how are you? Excellent, guys. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate a chance to talk to you. It is such a joy, Kevin, any time that Tom and I get together, and we'll see how things go over the course of this year, but broadcasters, as far as we know, to start the year, will not actually be literally getting together. But when we've gotten together in the past, when my lug nuts have taken on Tom's Dragons, just to sit and talk and exchange stories. So Tom, if you don't mind, when did you first enter professional baseball as a broadcaster? Well, I'll just give you a little story about that. How about that one? I graduated from college at Ball State University. This has taken me back to February of 1988, so a long time ago. And I knew I wanted to get into minor league baseball. I got up the nerve, I'm t at that time especially, but even so now, I was a rather reserved person. And in those days, um, no internet, of course. And I called the voice of the closest team and he's still to this day the voice of that same team. His name is Howard Kelman, great gentleman with the Indianapolis Indians. I listened to him many times on the radio. And I, I said to him, I'd like to get into minor league baseball as a broadcaster. Do you have any advice at all for me? And he said, well, this season, it was February of that year. His season was going to begin in a couple of months. And he said, maybe it's a little late for this year uh, in terms of a full-time position, but we, we could have possibly a few openings for some games. The number two man, the color commentator, Indianapolis, was a member of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. So on nights when they had concerts, he couldn't do the games. His name was Tom Akins, and they needed someone to fill in. So Howard said, send me your tape. We'll take a listen. I sent him my tape on cassette in those days. The announcers now don't know what a cassette is, I don't think, but... Uh, we went from cassettes to CDs to links, but uh, in those days it was cassettes. He called me a few days later. He said, I listened to your tape. We've got one game for you, promise. I went down, did that game, April of 1988. It was against the Buffalo Bisons. I still remember doing the starting lineups that day with Howard. About halfway through the game, he came back in the booth and he said, Tom, we've got some more games for you. <laughs> and, and that one is, of course, music to my ears. I drove home that night up Interstate 69 to my home in Muncie. It was about an hour and 20 minute drive home. And I did uh, two seasons with Howard, no pay, just did, uh, I don't know, when Tom Akins couldn't do the games, there were probably around 50 games that I did between those two seasons with Howard. He became kind of my mentor, taught me the ropes. And after two years with Indianapolis, I got my first full-time job with the Kinston Indians as the voice of the Kinston Ball Club in the Carolina League. Incidentally, Jesse and Kevin, a couple of names on my first few teams. How about these for names starting out my career? Indianapolis, my first season. The big unit, Randy Johnson. My second season. Oh. My second season was uh, Larry Walker. And my third season in Kinston, when I was actually the voice of the team, we had this young man that was a very shy, quiet kid that came in and joined us. I remember asking him one day, how do you pronounce your name? I want to make sure I'm saying it right, right on the radio. And he said, it's Jim. And I said, no, no, your last name. And he said, <laughs> he said, it's Tommy. I said, okay, we'll make sure we say Jim Tommy, Hall of Famer. So Randy Johnson, Hall of Famer. Larry Walker, Hall of Famer. Jim Tommy, Hall of Famer. First three years. I thought that's the way it was supposed to work. <laughs> it worked that way all the way, but that was the way it worked for me early on, and I was grateful to have that chance. So that's how I got started. Howard Kelman was the man. He gave me the opportunity and taught me how to announce baseball, and, and I think uh, a couple of things that he taught me were, number one, be serious about your craft. Treat every game as if, and, and I've, I've still taken this to this day, as if it's the only game that the listener will ever hear you do because you're only as strong as your weakest link. 
And if, if they only hear you do one game and that's your worst game or not your best game, that's all they have to go on. So every game has to be as good as you can do it. Every inning, when it's 12 to one in the sixth inning and you want to check out, remember the person tuning in at that time, that might be the only time they've ever heard you do a game. Howard taught me that. The other thing he taught me was how to prepare. And, and I still, when I talk to a young broadcaster now and he wants me to listen to his tape, I say, well, I'll do that. But I also want to see your preparation, your notes. How do you set up your scorebook? That's really how your preparation dictates the quality of your broadcast as much as anything. And, and that's, that's what Howard taught me. So long story to begin our conversation today. That's how I got involved in baseball in 1988. And I've really never done anything else since then. Were you in Dayton since the beginning or did you come in there after the, the team was launched? I joined the Dayton Ball Club in 2008, Kevin. That, that was their uh, their ninth year. They okay. started in the year 2000. Mike Vanderwood was the voice of the team from their first season through year number eight. I came in in 2008. And so Mike and I have been the only two radio broadcasters for the Dragons over the, the history. And again, the first year was 2000. So they've had two announcers and the two of us have been here and grateful to be part of such a great organization. Well, that sort of I'm sums up that team, doesn't it? You know, it, everyone's everyone's long term there. Everyone's a lifer there. Kevin, I know you you've talked many times with the president here, Robert Murphy, and um, you you and your organization named the Dragons the team of the year, the organization of the year a few years back. We'd appreciate that. I'll never forget that. One of the highlights I know for all of us. And and uh, you're right. The the the, uh, the front office here has a number of people that have been here since longer than I have. And I've been here 13, 14 years, depending on whether you count last year as a year. Um, so we didn't do any games last year. We were here for a while, uh, but uh, it's been a great place for all of us. Mike Vanderwood, the fun fact is that he was the first broadcaster in the history of the Dayton Dragons after he was the first broadcaster in the history of the Lansing Lugnuts, that he'd that, come out of Michigan cool. State. That's correct, Jesse. That was 1996. I was in the same league and met Mike that year. I was in Fort Wayne. He was the first broadcaster for Lansing. What a, a great ballpark when, when uh, I think it was at Oldsmobile Park at that time, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And, and it was an absolute Taj Mahal when it opened in 1990. Still a great ballpark for this day. And, and it's, it's undergone a couple of renovations, but a great place. I love going there. Really love going there. Uh, but in 1996, when it opened up, uh, I'll tell you, man, that was something. And uh, that was right at the time when minor league baseball facilities took a big jump forward. And, and it was at the top at that at that time and uh, and still is, again, a, a great facility to this day. I want to go back into those players that you mentioned briefly before we get into ballparks. This being the Ballpark Digest broadcaster chat. What was it like to watch a young Randy Johnson, for instance? Well, he was a he was a hard thrower at that time, of course, and and you didn't know if he was going to harness the control needed to be a, a great pitcher. And you know, one of the things that we see in this business, Jesse, and you've seen it many times, I'm sure, is oftentimes you hear exaggerations about players, and then you see the player for the first time, and most of the time it doesn't quite live up to what you've been told. There's, there are some exceptions, but you, you heard this guy throws in those days. If you, if you, if they said he throws 90 miles an hour, that was absolute gas. Um, and now it would be below average, which is, uh, I don't know what's happened there, whether the guns have changed or the pitchers have changed or what, but uh, you, and they talked about Randy Johnson at that time as like a mid nineties guy. And, and by our standards today, it would probably be more like 103, 104. But uh, uh, you, you just, you know, you saw the ability. The control wasn't as sharp. And, and uh, eventually, of course, he was actually traded while a member of the Indianapolis team to uh, Seattle in a deal that brought a veteran pitcher to Montreal as they were trying to win a, a World Series, Mark Langston. And Johnson went to uh, Seattle and boy, what a collection of young talent they had around that time. Ken Grippy Jr. and, and, and Johnson and, and uh, uh, Jay Buhner. And, and uh, there were, uh, there were several Martinez, others as well. Yes. Yeah. All right, let's get into ballparks, Tom. Because, I mean, 
so far we've talked about the Midwest League and then going to Kinston Carolina League, but you've broadcasted in multiple leagues. So what ballparks stand out in your mind, whether they're a Taj Mahal or whether there are other things about them that have made them memorable? You know, I think a broadcaster has a different perspective because we are there to do a job and not so much to, um, to enjoy the, uh, the, the character as much. I mean, you do, you do enjoy that, but you, you enjoy a place to broadcast from that is, uh, is easy to call the game. I'll give you, I'll give you my first game as a primary announcer ever. First game I ever did solo. First game I ever did as the voice of a team would have been April of, of 1990, Port Kenston, Dur the old Durham Athletic Park. And we're playing the Durham Bulls, which of course is where they, I think, I'm pretty sure they filmed a lot of the movie Bull Durham there. And the press box was actually a third dugout. It was directly behind home plate, but it was below ground level, similar to a dugout. So you were right, you were maybe <clears throat> 10 feet behind the umpire. You could hear, the umpire could hear you. The umpire could hear everything you said, every word you said, as could the players, uh, the catcher, the batter. You were right behind home plate and it was a right-handed batter. You got blocked out on any ball hit to the right side because he would cross in front of you from the right-hand batter's box. And so if there was a ground ball to the second baseman, you would see the ball go that direction, but you wouldn't know. And then you waited until the right-hand batter crossed in front of you. And then you, you saw the play and called the play. Uh, everything was done from literally your head was maybe two feet above the ground. So you, you were, you were at ground level. Uh, interesting. That was my first game. I, I didn't know. Of course, when you're a young broadcaster, you think that's the way things are everywhere. And it was different. Now, like I said, probably around, I don't know, the mid nineties, the newer, more expensive ballparks started to come in. I love Lansing in our league, West Michigan in our league was a great place to call a game at that time, brand new ballpark in 1994. Um, I, I went to the Southern league and our ballpark, Hank Aaron stadium in Mobile, where I worked was brand new as well. And I love that place when we, when we opened it. Although uh, again, you don't know the difference when you're starting out or a young bro, you're just happy to be there. We had no air conditioning in the press box in Mobile, Alabama on, on, on the, the bay. Uh, and it every night in Mobile was 98 degrees with, with 70, 80% humidity, no air conditioning in the press box. And you didn't care because you were just happy to be there. And uh, that, that was a place I enjoyed. I really enjoyed the old Hoover Met in Birmingham. Loved that place as well. Um, and then Jacksonville came along with their new Paul Park in about 2000, I think, right in that. It may be, maybe a couple of years later, it might have been 2002. And that was, that was probably the, the, the new best place in terms of um, ballpark just amenities and being a, a, a modern stadium with everything being nice. And, uh, and I continued on and, and uh, um, actually went to, uh, uh, was in Mobile for eight years and, and then uh, got a chance. I had a long-term relationship with a name, Kevin, I know you, you know this name. Mike Tatoyan was a close friend of mine yeah. now with the uh, Dover Motor Speedway. Yeah. And Mike and I were together for like 13 years and, and he, uh, he was like a big brother to me. And he, he, he started a new company called uh, Victory Sports. And I, I, I went with him to uh, uh, Gary, Indiana. And the ballpark there was outstanding when they built that place in uh, 2002, I think, in the Northern League. I stayed there three years. We had three great years. And uh, our team won the championship, two of the three. And, and, and Jesse, as you know, a championship for a broadcaster is, is so special. Um, every night your, your job is to make people happy and winning games makes people happy. It's so much more fun to be around the players every day and the coaches, they're in a good mood. Uh, you come to the ballpark every day and, and knowing you've got a good chance to win and you're watching the standings and the scores of the other games to see uh, if you can gain a game on somebody in the pennant race and, and uh, enjoy that. And then I came here to Dayton and again, great ballpark, just Nothing like you would have ever seen when I started out 
in, in 1988, even at the AAA level, you would, you would not have seen a place like this. Day Air Ballpark is our ballpark and uh, just a beautiful place, great place to call a game. And, and uh, some, once in a while, we'll be on the bus riding down the, the highway and, and uh, somebody will complain about something. I'll just be thinking to myself, if you only knew, if you only knew what it was like um, when, when we were announcing games in 1990, 1991, I mean, little things like the, um, the quality of the hotels we stay in now is just 100% better than it was in those days. And uh, um, it, it's all better for us. And uh, um, things have gotten better for broadcasters. The, the new guys coming in now don't, don't, don't know that, but uh, uh, the old guys like myself, we, we know how much better things are than they were uh, in many ways, uh, you know, 30 years ago. Kevin, so, I think about all the names that Tom just named. Yeah. Uh, and especially the ballpark names. So when Tom and I go back and forth telling stories, one story that he'll tell will trigger a story for me, which will trigger a story for him. Has anything that he said triggered memories for you? No, I re when I started doing the site way back when, uh, Gary had just opened or hadn't just opened uh, with the with the delay there. Uh, and and I've, I've not been out there. I hear it's held up really well. You know, Pat Salvi, the owner of the team now is... He's a stickler for cleanliness, to put it mildly. And so they do a lot of, a lot of good maintenance there. I was just thinking overall, the Midwest League or high A Central um, this year, and now with, with Clinton and Burlington gone and Beloit getting a new ballpark, it's, it's a pretty spiffy little circuit right now, isn't it? It is. Uh, and just going back to Gary for one moment, th th I think uh, I was there in – Oh, five, oh, six, oh, seven. I remember the first time my dad came up and I took him on a little tour of the ballpark. And he's, I remember him saying to me, I remember to this day, I remember this comment. He said, what are the minor leagues trying to compete with the major league parks now with these ballparks? That, that's how nice the park in Gary was. Um, and, and I honestly, I haven't been back there since I uh, came to Dayton, but it was a great place. But uh, uh, our league now, um, no complaints with the facilities. I mean, um, you've got, and our, I love our division. We you just one place after another. And Jesse uh, would say the same. I mean, uh, South Bend, beautiful place to call a game, beautiful ballpark. Um, Lansing's a great place. West Michigan's a great place. I love going to Midland, Michigan with the Great Lakes Loons and calling games there. Um, and I don't want to say anything bad about anyone, but there is there's one place that um, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything bad about anyone, but I'm, I'm gonna say there was one park that had a a very difficult vantage point in our, in our league. Uh, you were actually located above the third base coaching box. So you were directly looking at the third base coaches back. And um, it is hard to, it's hard to tell where the, the direction of the ball, you, you just don't know. I mean, the ball's headed, it looks like it's going in the gap between left and center field. And you're calling a play differently. If a ball is hit right at the left fielder or the center fielder, then you are a ball off the bat that's headed toward the gap and going to be extra bases. You're calling that play totally differently, and you just didn't know because you didn't have the perspective and the angle. That 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 team's moved on to a, a new league. Best of luck to them. Um, we won't be calling games from that perspective anymore, but uh, uh, hopefully maybe somebody else will, will enjoy it more than I did from that, that particular angle. But uh, that's the way it goes sometimes. Tom, a, a stadium that I don't think that you mentioned just now was Fort Wayne. Oh, that, and that's the – that's, that's a great ballpark. I don't know how I left them out. And I'll give you a quick, quick note on that one. Um, the, uh, of course, for the fans that don't know my history at all, um, I, I joined the Fort Wayne Wizards in 1993 when they opened up as a franchise. Our owner at that time was Eric Marganow, who owned several teams. He eventually bought the Mobile team, and that's how I wound up in Mobile. But um, um, the uh, Fort Wayne team opened up on a cold night in April in 1993 in Memorial Stadium. Uh, and uh, I was there for their first four years and I went to Mobile. And then I came back to the Midwest League and they built a new ballpark in uh, 2008, I'm sorry, 2009 was the first year of the new ball downtown park. And as luck would have it, Dayton opened up in Fort Wayne that year. And so I could say, and this gives you an idea, I guess, how I've been doing this too long. 
I not only called the first game ever played in this ballpark, but I called the first game ever played in the ballpark. They just shut down to open up this ballpark. And uh, that, that's, again, uh, just the way things went. Love it. Uh, so just to trace your path as we've been going through, Indianapolis to Kinston, and then went, from Kinston to Fort Wayne? I actually went to Peoria for two years and uh, worked with the Peoria Chiefs and, and uh, um, a lot of fans know the name Pete Vinokin, who I, I got to know pretty well, longtime owner. I actually worked there for the two years that he didn't own the team. He had sold the team and then bought the team back. There was a Chicago businessman that owned the team when I was there. I was there two years and then got a chance to go to Fort Wayne and, and uh, 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 enjoyed that a lot there. Uh, uh, great place to work. Enjoyed the city. I'm from Indiana and... Uh, and then, and then when, when Dr. Marganow opened up uh, Mobile, it was a chance to move up to AA, and I jumped at that opportunity and stayed there eight years. But uh, um, so you got, you got uh, Indianapolis, Kenston, Peoria, Fort Wayne, Mobile, Gary, Dayton. There's a story from Mobile, a story from the Southern League that I have to ask you to tell. All right. Tell me about the time that you saw a player get arrested mid-game. <laughs> on the field yep um we had uh, we, we were playing in orlando florida at the uh i think it was called and jesse you may know this or or, or kevin uh i believe the official name of the ballpark was cracker jack field it was the orlando atlanta brave spring training site at that time and the double a affiliate of the tampa bay at that time devil rays played there and um and it, it was an odd situation to begin with because you had this major league spring training site, which held like, I don't know, 10,000 fans and, and was first class in every way. And you had a, a Florida team. And it's, it's tough to draw fans in Florida, in the Florida climate for minor league baseball. I, I don't think I'm going out on a limb by saying that. And so they would, uh, oftentimes have really small crowds and in this huge, enormous ballpark. And so the, the, the atmosphere was different because of that. And, and the other thing, they hired a bunch of Disney employees who were kind of trying to get a start entertainment to be their on-field entertainment, on-field host, back in the days when on-field hosts were just starting out in, in minor league baseball. And they were exceptionally good in many cases so you had this big league quality on-field entertainment in a big league ballpark with big league sound and a big league scoreboard, and there'd be like 200 people in the ballpark. It, it was just an unusual setting. And one day, and, and I, I, I'll, I'll give you this from a journalistic standpoint. In other words, I'm telling you what I would tell you if I were covering this as a journalist without any opinion, just the facts as I know them. One day, our left fielder struck out and was upset, walked back to the dugout and became a little bit emotional after striking out as players often do. And the mascot for the Orlando team apparently started heckling him. And he, depending on whose side of the story you believe, either sort of with his glove swatted at the mascot, or if you believe the mascot, actually started hitting the mascot hard with the glove. And the mascot uh, filed charges, assault charges against the player. And the next day we start the game and it's about middle of the second inning and, and our left fielder goes out to his position and we're in the middle of the inning and all of a sudden time is called and our manager, Mike Basso, I believe it was, starts motioning for the left fielder to come in from his position. He, he, he steps, our manager steps out, out of the dugout, walks about halfway to the foul line and starts managing for, motioning for the left fielder to come in. I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? Either this guy's just been traded and they want to get him off the field because they don't want to risk injury I'm, I'm just running in my mind all the possibilities that why a player would be literally pulled off the field between innings or during the inning of a game with no injury. And 
I don't know anything different until the game's over. I get on the bus after the game and I find out that the player was actually taken off in handcuffs and taken straight to the police station and charged with um, assault. Uh, and I don't think it actually went anywhere. Um, I do believe he was, now some of this could be, this part I'm gonna, I'm gonna say as a journalist could be enhanced by whoever told the story to me, but I, I was told that he was banned from all Disney properties worldwide for life based on that, based on that. Uh, uh, and I, I, so he couldn't play again in the rest of the series. He was out for the rest of the series. And I thought, how can they do that? Only the league president can suspend a player. They can't tell us one of our players can't play in the game. He's a key player for us, but we didn't fight it. I think they just wanted to keep it um, non-confrontational, let this pass and let it go. And, and it eventually just went away. But unusual sight to see a player brought in the police were right down there in the in, in the uh, dugout and they took him off in handcuffs and uh, that was the end of his day and he didn't play again that series <laughs> just such a story i'm imagining a player at bush stadium doing something wrong and they tell him you can never drink bush again <laughs> I, my, my thought at the time was how can they do this i mean they can't take these kind of matters into their own hands uh, but they did, and we didn't fight it, so uh, we let it go. And uh, I still remember to this day that side of our manager stepping out, walking halfway to the foul line, and signaling the left fielder, who of course had no idea what was going on, into the dugout to be arrested. Yeah. And, and again, he his his side of the story was I did nothing. This was all uh, this was all um, exaggerated, and so I don't know if the truth was somewhere in the middle or or what, but. Uh, that was that was the incident that day that, that happened in Orlando. They can do it. Disney's its own government down there. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they can do whatever they want on their property. They can ban, you know, you or me from their property. So, uh, but to do it in the middle of a game is a little, <laughs> is, is, is pretty, pretty, uh, I don't want to use the word I'm thinking of, but it's, it's pretty uh, brave. Let's put it that yeah. way. Well, can you imagine somebody banning a guy from attending a, uh, an event at Yankee, a player from being at Yankee Stadium in the middle of the World Series? You can't come back to Yankee Stadium again. It's the middle of the World Series. That would, I don't think that would fly. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, that's a story that you had told me that stuck in my memory. Uh, of all the games that you've seen and of all the stories that you've told, do you have a favorite thing that happened, a favorite story that you love telling? I didn't know Jesse before. We started this interview exactly what you were going to ask me. I've got a, I've got a couple. I'll try not to go too long with these because I know we're, we're, we're well into this interview. I got a couple of, I'll try to, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. The, the strangest ending to a game I've ever seen. Okay, I'm going to go back to the year 2000 in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We're playing the Chattanooga Lookouts. I'm with the Mobile team. And the night begins, it's, I should say, it's the last game of the series. We're heading out of town after the game. We're in Chattanooga. So being the last game of the series, the curfew rules don't apply. So you can go as long as you need to. If it's, if it's not the last game of the series, there's a 12.50 a.m. curfew. No inning can begin after 12.50 a.m. And uh, if it's the last game of the series, that, that rule is waived. So we have a two-hour rain delay to start the night. So it's a seven o'clock game. First pitch is thrown at uh, nine o'clock, right around nine o'clock. I think it was like nine Oh five or something like that. And we play this game and it's, it's just a typical double a ball game. And we go to the ninth inning and it's a, I don't remember the exact score, but I do remember Chattanooga had a three run lead going to the ninth inning. And by this time, it's right at midnight, right at midnight. And the first two batters of the inning are retired. So innocent start to the inning. Never had any idea I'd be telling this story 21 years later based on where we were at that point. Midnight, two out, nobody on, Chattanooga leading by three runs. And the next batter, it's a mile high pop-up toward the shortstop, and he comes in. And the game's about to be over. And, and uh, Larry Ward, a name both you guys, I'm sure, know, the Chattanooga longtime broadcaster. 
I can hear Larry next door packing up his stuff because they're, they're going on the road too. And, and I can hear Larry packing up his books and he's going to get out of the press box. He's going to, he's going to go on to uh, wherever they go. And the ball comes down and just clanks off the shortstop's glove and falls away. Okay. No big deal. Man on first, two out. They still lead us by three runs. The next batter hits a routine ground ball to the shortstop, and he fields it, throws to first base. Game's going to be over. It hits the glove of the Chattanooga first baseman, Ben Broussard, and actually breaks the webbing in his first baseman's mitt, and the ball literally goes right through his glove, and the batter's safe at first. Breaks the webbing, ball goes through the glove. So now we've got two out, two on, and guess what? The time runs coming to the plate, and you know where this is going. Okay, so they bring in their all-star closer. And Larry's not too happy right now because now we've just had to sit through a pitching change <laughs> at midnight, and it's been a long night, and we're, we're heading out. And uh, I'm not happy either, but Larry's especially, he's not, he's not happy at this point. And, uh, and I love Larry Ward, so I don't want to sound like I'm – but, but here, here we go. So they bring in their all-star closer, Bo Donaldson, to face our five foot eight inch second baseman, John Powers. And Bo Donaldson throws a pitch and wouldn't you know it, John Powers blasts one as far as he can hit one over the right field fence for a game tying three run home run. And we're going nowhere. So <laughs> I hear Larry just cracking something down on the table in the booth next to me. And he is furious and the next batter comes up and we don't score again that inning. So we end up going to extra innings. So we play the 11th inning and nobody scores. We play the 12th, the 10th inning, 11th inning, 12th inning, nobody scores. Um, we're going on and on and it's way past 1 a.m. We're getting to 2 a.m. And we get to the, we get to the top of the, I think the top of the 14th inning. Both teams are out of players at this point. And Chattanooga brings in their right fielder to catch their catcher to pitch and they put a starting pitcher who wasn't pitching that day in right field and, I, and he lined his name was eddie priest he pitched in the big leagues briefly he lined up about two steps in fair territory wanting no part whatsoever of a fly ball hit to right field so he's out there again literally five feet from the foul line so so uh and their catcher gets us out without a run in the, in the, in the top of the 14th, 14th inning. So Chattanooga comes to bat bottom half of the 14th inning. They load the bases with two out. And the only guy they've got up is that pitcher to bat. And he bats with no possible pinch hitters available. Bases loaded, two out, tie game. And he hits what would be the perfect swinging bunt toward third base. It's going to win the game for Chattanooga. The third baseman, Alex Pelias, comes in. He's not even going to throw the ball to first. He comes in. Ball is rolling dead, perfectly placed, a swinging bunt. And on the way to first base, the pitcher pulls a hamstring <laughs> and doesn't even make it to the bag. He goes down halfway between home plate and first base. Alex Pelias picks the ball up, throws to first, and we go to the 15th inning. <laughs> and it's we're coming up on 3 a.m. And and, uh, and at this point, the catcher who's now out there for his second inning as a pitcher completely loses the ability to throw strikes. I think he walked about five or six guys in that inning, and we scored about four runs. And if you looked at the box score, you'd never know. We won the game like uh, – seven to three or something like that eight to eight to four maybe and, and, and that's the way the game ended that was the craziest finish to a game i have ever seen in my life that's wild what a <laughs> classic uh, how was larry doing at the end of the game it, not happy not happy <laughs> <laughs> not only did he end up staying till almost 3 a.m but they lost <laughs> I remember calling a game Montgomery against Chattanooga and Jim Toko by my side. The umpire made a terrible call that went against Chattanooga. And Jim gave me a subtle elbow and he said, look at Larry, look at Larry. <laughs> and there was Larry just stewing next to us. 
<laughs> such respect for him. I, I've got one more, Jesse. If we, do we have time for one more story? Yes, oh, we do. We yes, do. Let me, do. Let me give you one more. This is one of my favorites. Um, and it, it took place in uh, one of my seasons in Peoria. We had a rough, rough year that year. Didn't win many games. But we did have one player who was the league leader that season in hit batsman. His name was Jim Wolf. He was our catcher. Stood right up on the plate. If the ball was two inches inside, it was going to hit him. We called him Wolfie. And we get to the last day of the season, very last day, and Wolfie is actually one away from the all-time Midwest League record, which I, I believe was broken by your player uh, about four or five years ago, a Lansing player, oh, most times hit by pitch. I think I could look this up on baseball reference, but I think Wolfie was hit like 26 times that year. It may have been broken in the interim before your guy in Lansing broke it a, a, a few years ago. Um, but uh, anyway, we get to the last game of the season. Wolfie is one away from the league record for number of times hit by pitch. And I went down and talked to him before the game. And I said, you know, Wolfie, it's been a rough year. We have not won many games. You've got a chance to do something really special today. Break an all-time Midwest League record. And he thought about it for a second and he said, I'm going to do it. And at, at that time in the old uh, mining field in Peoria, the home and visiting clubhouses were right together. And you could just walk out one door and walk in the other. And I walked over there and I found the, the starting pitcher for the Waterloo Diamonds, a team that doesn't even exist anymore. Became the Lansing Lug. That's Lansing. right. Yep. They had a pitcher, Cameron Karen Cross, Australian kid. And I explained to him, Wolfie is one away from the all-time Midwest League record for number of hit by pitch, can you help us out? And, and he and, and he said, "Sure, I'll hit him." And uh, <laughs> so we start the game, and Wolfie comes up to bat, and uh, there's there's a, a couple of guys. I, I can't remember. There was there was people on base at the time. First base was open, but there were, there was somebody on base, or maybe second and third. I can't remember exactly the situation. He comes up to bat. And the first pitch comes in right at him and instincts kick in and he steps back out of the way. Ball one. Okay. So the pitcher gets the ball back from the catcher. Another pitch about batting practice speed right at Wolfie. And again, he steps back out of the way and the pitcher's looking in like you are the guy we talked about before the game. Right. <laughs> and um, check the uniform number. <laughs> right. Right. And, and uh, now it's, it's, uh, it's two and oh, and I'm thinking along with the pitcher, and he's thinking, look, this is the last game of the season. I'm not going to give up runs here and, and, and mess around with this guy and give up earned runs, and my ERA is going to go up. So the next pitch he throws, fastball hard over the plate, down the middle, and wouldn't you know, Wolfie swings and whacks one over the left center field fence for a home run. And the pitcher is absolutely out of his mind furious. He's throwing the rosin bag down, staring Wolfie down around the, all the way around the bases. And Wolfie gets to home plate and looks out at him like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, so the next time up, Wolfie ties the league record for the most, most uh, times hit by pitch. And, and, and it, it didn't take many pitches for it to happen. Um, so that, that was, uh, that was my recap for my time in Peoria that day, last game of the season, um, a pitcher and a hitter kind of collaborating on a league record that uh, had a little twist to it. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, I love it. Uh, the player from Lansing, his name was Nick Sine. Okay. Yep. Hit by a pitch 38 times in 79 games. That was unbelievable. So Nick Sine, um, first, uh, at one point in the season, he was something like one for 50, two for 50 against either left-handed pitchers, right-handed pitchers. He, he just had terrible splits. Um, the bat wasn't so good when he was trying to swing it, but when he was getting hit, he was great. But I remember him trying to get out of the way of one pitch for the only time that season. And it hit the bat square in the knob below his hands. And it turned into a tie-breaking game-winning RBI single oh. against South Bend. Oh, my goodness. My, only he, in minor league baseball. When the, he was uh, hit by pitches, Tom, 
so we had the Hawkeye, we had uh, the different systems to see where those pitches were. And all the guys crowded around after every game to see was the pitch right a, down the middle. It, it got hit probably out of those 38, probably like 18 of them were strikes. You know, I, I remember that player because something I almost never do, I did with involving that player. And that was, I actually sent a text to a coach in the middle of a game from the press box. We, we, we had an extra inning game with you guys and bases loaded, winning run on third in Lansing. So walk off situation and he comes up to bat. And I'm thinking there is no way that this is gonna have any outcome other than a walk off hit by pitch. And I texted our, one of our, our coaches, I think our bench coach to say, this guy leads the league and hit batsman. He better not miss two inches inside or the game's gonna be, it doesn't have to be two inches. He better not miss on the inside corner or the game's going to be over in, in, in a short order. Um, and I, as I recall, Jesse, I don't think we hit him. So I don't know how we, we miss hitting him because that, that's what he does. Ron Hunt was the leaguer that did that forever. Um, and I don't know how we miss hitting him that day. We lost a lot of ways to, we lost a game in Lansing on an, uh, a wild pitch during intentional walk. You remember that, Jesse? I sure do. Wild was it a pitch. wild pitch or a passed ball? I think it was a wild pitch during an intentional walk, if I remember correctly. I don't, some guys you'll have, you'll see certain pitchers get the yips on intentional walks. They just can't do it. I guess it's, we had a, we had a pitcher in mobile that believe it or not, you're going to say again, you're making this up. It happened <laughs> when, when we got to situations where we had uh, to issue an intentional walk. And this is back in the days when you threw the ball for intentional walks. Uh, you threw four pitches. We brought in our third baseman to pitch, and, and and our pitcher went over and stood by third base for one batter because he was going to throw it to the backstop on an intentional walk. Not every time did we do that, but if it was a like a key situation, extra inning game where a wild pitch was going to lose the game, we would take him out. For, of course, if you if the pitcher stays in the game, he can come right back in. Yeah. So we would move him to third base for that intentional walk and let our third baseman come in and throw four pitches outside the zone and then put our pitcher back into pitch again. Crazy. Only in minor league baseball. <laughs> Kevin, we've kept you quiet for the majority of this. I, I warned you guys coming in that I was just going to sit back and listen. And I, I have been, and it's been very enjoyable. Let's get right into our term from the baseball thesaurus. And Tom, you've got one in mind. I do, and I, I want to know if it's uh, – Jesse, you're the expert on this, and we talk during the season. I'll ask you questions sometimes about terminology, and I want to know if this is urban legend or true in terms of how this term developed. The term Texas League hit or Texas League single, how did that, how did that term develop? Yeah, I think you and I have heard the exact same thing, which is in the spacious fields of the Texas League where the outfielders had to play so deep, and right, because – uh, as you and I had both heard, maybe there weren't fence. Um, so if the outfielders are deep, it was easy for the hitter. All you've got to do is just dunk one over the infielders. You've got yourself a Texas leaguer. So it was a hit only in the Texas league. It's a great story. I, I've heard that. And uh, one of those things that just, it, it's, it stands up to the test of time that that's how it developed over the years. Although now we would call it what the double A South. <laughs> the double a central whatever uh, so i guess now the texas league is the double a central but you know that whole idea the texas leaguer being i would compare it to a flare or a blooper in terms of it's just a pop-up that lands in between the infield and the outfield yeah and there are there are uh moments in baseball history and jesse if you ever did a um a video version of your baseball thesaurus, there's probably a, a hit somewhere along the way that you can think of in, in your history. For me, it would be the Joe Morgan base hit in game seven of the 1975 World Series that basically won the series for the Reds. I was a Reds fan. It was that same kind of play, a little blooper over the infield, brought in what turned out to be the winning run. This was, of course, the day after Carlton Fisk hit the the homer off the foul pole. Boston Red Sox fans to this day think they won that series three games to four, but uh, it was a Reds World Series champion. 
I think of Luis Gonzalez, 2001 World Series against right. Mariano Rivera. That ball didn't get all that far over, but with the infield in, with Derek Jeter in at short, whoosh, right over the top. Um, I think it was the University of Texas's field back in the day that was the cliff. It had the cliff. That, right? The two-tiered. So the Texas Longhorns, you could play, if you were the right fielder, you could play on the top side or you could play on the bottom side the two story you want to play on the upper floor or the lower floor and if you uh, played up high then that meant your second baseman your first baseman had to get anything that was down below but if you play down below anything up above is now a home run so the old two-tier outfield i cannot get over seeing those photographs that's amazing that's amazing yeah college baseball was a wild wild west back in those days yeah, that's well, a great, Tom that's a great bit of information. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank, thank you, Kevin. Tom, this has been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Reichard, final thoughts. Uh, I have no final thoughts. This has been so enjoyable listening to the two of you chat, you know, uh, makes me kind of want to be a broadcaster at times. We get to see a lot. It's, it's great. So Tom, Nichols, a lot of bad hotels too. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse, if I could say one thing before I go, I want to say, uh, hello to my mother who's battling a health uh, problem and has been for a while. And uh, she's listened to every game I've called, I think, for the last 20 years. And just say, love you, mom, and uh, see you soon. The voice of the Dayton Dragons, Tom Nichols. For Kevin Reichardt, I'm Jesse goldberg Strasser. Check things out on ballparkdigest.com. This has been the Ballpark Digest Broadcaster Chat. <laughs>